and welcome to the March Madness edition of And They're Off. We were supposed to have Dennis Rodman on the show today, but he's busy picking a pope and bringing peace to the Middle East. We do have Steve Haskin, though, who is picking the Dallas Cowboys to win the NCAA basketball tournament. <laughs> well, I'm between picking them to win that or the next year's Super Bowl. So let me, let, let me decide which one, yeah, for your yeah. sake. For your, for your sake, it should be the NCAAs. This way, it'll get it over with, so you don't have to listen to it all next year again. Keep throwing it at the wall till it sticks. All right. Steve, a couple of shows ago, we talked about your old buddy, Comet to the Top, and how he, unlike so many horses, survived running in the Kentucky Derby, a race he really shouldn't have been anywhere near. Now it's nearly two years later, and he is still going strong a third in the San Carlos, and then a cross-country trip to win the Tom Fool handicap one week later. Steve, is this not a throwback horse? Yes, he is, and I love it. And let him be a reminder to all trainers of just what a thoroughbred can accomplish. What is a thoroughbred made of? They don't have to be babied. Listen. We saw these kind of horses 40 years ago when they would come back and run every week and they did things of incredible strength and fortitude. Uh, horses now don't do this and it's nice to see a horse come back and do what he did. I mean, to run a week later and travel cross country and then get involved in a race where it looks like he's gonna finish fourth at best to come again and win. And listen, kudos to trainer Peter Miller for taking a shot and doing, you know, something that seemed to be very bold and audacious move. He obviously knows his horse. And coincidentally, with his performance, got an email the other day from Bill Hirsch, who was the son of, of Buddy Hirsch and the grandson of Max Hirsch. And out of a clear blue sky, he just happened to send the entire two-month work schedule and race schedule of assault when he won the triple crown and i must share this and i hope all trainers <laughs> don't don't necessarily do this at home <laughs> but this has this has been done first of all assault in april and may okay leading and, and remember this is a horse who swept the triple crown in april and may he ran six times he ran three times in april and then then swept the uh, triple crown from april 1st to june 1st during that time, not only did he run in six stakes, he worked out 19 times <laughs> in those two months. And the total amount of his workouts added up to 12 miles of, of, of workouts. And now you gotta remember, this is a horse who not only worked a mile two days before winning the Wood Memorial, then went on and won the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. But now he's trying for the Belmont Stakes, and th I have to read this off. May 22nd, he works a mile in 143 and three. May 24th, he works three furlongs in 35 flat. May 25th, he works a mile and a quarter in 205. May 28th, he works four furlongs in 50. On May 29th, three days before the Belmont Stakes, he works a mile and a half <laughs> in 232, and then three days later, he wins the Belmont Stakes and sweeps the Triple Crown in 230 and four. So by winning the Belmont Stakes, he ran a second and a fifth faster than he worked out three days earlier. I mean, again, trainers, don't try this at home, but just shows you what a thoroughbred is made of. And it's just great that this came out right after Comet to the top accomplished what he did. That was another old guy still doing it, Steve. Uh, you know, when a horse loses a race, he figures to win. There are plenty of excuses to go around. But after watching Game On Dude win another big cap for his third straight victory after that brutal run in the Breeders' Cup Classic, maybe the excuse of getting a bad ride that day is actually true. Game on dude, now a six-year-old. Steve, he's looking pretty damn good. Oh boy, did he, I mean, I've never seen that horse look so good. I mean, he just was gliding around there. And again, 
credit to Mike Smith, he rode that horse absolutely perfectly. I mean, this is a horse that you have to let him roll. You don't want this horse going in 48 and 49 and taking a stranglehold. Uh, that's what happened in the Breeders' Cup, and there's no way in the world he should ever be ridden that way by ta being taken off the pace and being strangled down. This is a free-running horse. What he wants to do is go out there, give him his head, let him go out there in 46 and 47, and string the feel out and kill off all those horses behind him and then make the come from behind horses like Iran the Greek have to do way too, and Richard's kid do way too much to have to try and catch him. And he just went out there and just ran everybody into the ground. That's the way he likes to run. And I tell you, when he's allowed to run a race like that, he's, I mean, he's as good as it gets. And he got to give him an awful lot of credit. And again, got to give credit to Bob Baffert. You know, they've persevered with this horse. Thank goodness he's a gelding. And He's just, uh, he's just a horse you love to watch. But boy, watching him come down the stretch with Mike Smith in perfect uh, uh, sync with him, I mean, it was a thing of beauty to watch. I just love seeing six-year-olds doing what he's doing, you know. Uh, so yeah, congratulations to Bob Baffert and the Bernie Schiappa, Ernie Moody, uh, Terry Lanny's family, Joe Torrey. It's a, it's a great story. Uh, one other note on the Santa Anita, the great Ron McAnally. Uh, has a good one in Suggestive Boy, winner of the Kilroy Mile the other day. Uh, one of the nicest men you want to meet in this business, and uh, we're delighted that uh, legendary Ron McAnally has a, has a good one in Suggestive Boy. Steve Vijak looked like he could have beaten up Batman with the way he ran in the Gotham the other day. Uh, you were there at Aqueduct. How impressive was that run from Vijak? In the words of Ralph Cramden, oh, what a surprise. <laughs> I mean, tell you, watching this horse come down the stretch. Now, I'm watching it on a TV monitor. You know, it's hard to see exactly who this horse is. And, you know, you're watching the horse in front, watching to see if anybody's going to catch him. All of a sudden, you see this horse flying on the outside. And you can see he's coming from the back of the pack. As it turns out, he was coming from 10th in a field of 11. And when J track announcer John Embriel says, and that's Vijack, storming to the lead. I go, what? Vijack? How did that happen? This is a horse in his first three starts of his career had been right on or off the pace. He had never been worse than third, never been farther off the pace than two lengths. And here he is running 10th in a race. So for him to do what he did and then just draw off like that, I don't know what we're looking at here, but he cer I certainly have a lot more respect for this horse than I did before. You know, he's pet he's got a lot of sprinters in his pedigree but there's there's enough stamina and with his newfound running style you have to really take this horse seriously now as a legitimate derby contender yeah, another surprise about vijack is his sire uh and what has to be a considered a long shot into mischief is the sire of not just vijack but also golden sense two horses on your derby dozen list and uh, this really underscores, folks, the vagaries of trying to predict successful stallions. Uh, Spendthrift Farm included Into Mischief in a program where if you bred a mare to him in his first two seasons at stud, you got a lifetime breeding right to him for free. The breeders who went for that particular deal are sitting very pretty right about now. So congratulations to them. Uh, the now, let's, not, let's not forget, too, that Into Mischief also is a sire of a horse called Holiday Mischief, who just ran second to departing in the Texas Heritage Stakes on, on Saturday. So he's turned, into be, uh, turned out to be a heck of a good uh, sire. And if you read the backstory on Vijack in my uh, column on bloodhorse.com, you'll see what a total accident it was that the breeder, yeah. Carrie Brogdon of Mackville Hall, even got to breed the dam too into mischief. It was a total last-minute accident, and it's a pretty fascinating story. Yes, do read that on Steve's column. Uh, Steve, the Breeders' Cup board has decided it was only kidding when it declared this year's World Championships would be run Salix-free. Uh, the banned Salix movement has not caught on anywhere else in North America, so Breeders' Cup has pulled back and will again just run the two-year-old races Salix-free, the same as they did last year. Uh, 
Ali Tate of Darley has quit the board on principle because of this change. Uh, and while I admire that viewpoint, I must admit I figured Breeders' Cup would just run up the white flag. Uh, and it probably would have if it wouldn't have made them look so bad. So if this is just a face-saving move for a year, then just cut the charade now. I'm hopeful, though, that they continue on with this so we can at least have a sample big enough to make some intelligent decisions down the road concerning Salix and racing. Steve, you got anything on that? Uh, you know what? It doesn't make any sense. I don't, I don't understand singling out the two-year-olds. I mean, I don't understand the point they're trying to make on that. To me, it's like Major League Baseball banning steroids only for rookies, but it's okay to use it the next year. I mean, what, what's the point? I, I, don't, I don't understand why they're doing it. I know what they had in mind to do it by just starting the process at the bottom and letting it build. But if it's not going to, they seem to have gotten lost in everything, and they've got to come up with something concrete. Make a decision one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, but you can't. Yeah, you yeah. can't say I want to do this, but I'm not going to do it because of that. So I'm going to go back and and, and just have the two-year-olds again. I mean, it, wh why? I mean, why? Uh, why would the two-year-olds not run with with Salix? It's clearly a very split board. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Uh, clearly, there was no appetite to be out there by themselves as far as making the whole thing Salix free. Uh, I think if they quit it completely, they look like idiots, so th this was the compromise. But, you know, if, if it does further, you know, the experiment as far as seeing if this is a wise thing or not, I think actually something good could come of this, but I probably am optimistic and they will probably throw the whole thing in after this year anyway. Just stick go. to it. Do want stick to one thing. Yeah, that's all. You know, right. you, you have right. an agenda. You 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 have a mission. Yeah. Okay. So you have a mission. Stick to it. Don't keep wavering yeah. back and forth because you don't want to look bad or what yep. this person says. This person likes it. That person doesn't like it. And you yeah. want to please. You can't please everybody. Do what you feel is right and go ahead and imp and, and implement it. And yeah. that's it. The strength of your convictions, I believe it is. All right. There are some weeks where it seems like every story you read makes you want to go into an empty room and let out a primal scream. Uh, it happened to me over the past week. Story number one, while the jockey club just comes out with something called scheduling tool, which optimizes handle by calculating when tracks should run certain races so they don't uh, bump up against similar races at other tracks, guess what happens? Gulfstream Park and Calder announced they're going to run head-to-head -head every weekend for a year, eight miles apart from each other. Think the sport needs a central governing body? Story number two, the director of racing services in New York is exploring putting in synthetic tracks at Aqueduct and Belmont. He's going on a quote, fact-finding mission that includes talking to officials who market Tapita and those who produce Polytrack, unquote. That's like going to Dick Cheney on a fact-finding mission about weapons of mass destruction. Here's a fact for you, don't do it. Story number three, the politicians in Kentucky are already trying to raid revenues from instant racing machines before the state's highest court even decides whether the machines are legal. They won't okay casinos, but they're setting a new speed record for helping destroy the state's signature industry. These politicians treat this place like it's the horse crapital of the world. Story number four, a pizza chain is advertising pizza with steak on it. No, this has nothing to do with horse racing, but if you thought pineapple on pizza or stuffed crust was the lowest somebody could go, you're wrong. Steak on pizza, Steve, it's so wrong on so many levels, I can't even start to fathom it. <laughs> Boy, you're talking to a New Yorker. Hey, listen, you know what you all have to do, by the way? You put steak on a pizza, uh, basically what it is is a Philly cheesesteak with sauce on it, that's all. <laughs> yeah, it's saying the pizza isn't good enough to stand on its own is what it's saying. Yes, I know. Well, listen, you got to tinker around with everything. And I know these are big issues, by the way, because usually it takes a lot less for you to go into an empty room and let out a primal scream. Pizza, pizza with steak on it, I'm telling you, Steve. <laughs> It is not kosher, I will tell you they just that. Like the, they, just want, they, just want, they just want something they can call a porterhouse pie. <laughs> Stable boy. 
March Madness, will your UK Wildcats even get a chance to defend their title in the NCAA tourney? I, I think they'll be in it. And uh, two years ago, people wrote off that team, and they went to the Final Four. Tickets for this Saturday's game going for over a thousand bucks for Lower Arena. People still, people still believe in this team. <laughs> yeah, the people picking the tournament may not be believing them. They're, they're not paying a thousand bucks. It's the bubble, Stable. Boy. You're in the bubble. All right, just like John Travolta. We want to thank right. our viewers. How's that? What, what movie was that, Steve? Which one? John the, Travolta uh, was in a bubble. I don't know. The Bubble Boy? Oh, the Bubble Boy? Is that boy? what it was called? Uh, the, boy, the Boy in a Bubble or something like that? Unlike the Seinfeld Bubble Boy. It was a boy getting a massage in a bubble. We want to thank our viewers. We want to thank our great sponsor, Darby Dan Farm. We'll be back at you in two weeks, March 20th, with more ATO madness. Steve, until then, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.